So welcome to the podcast, Tom. It's great to have you today. Thanks for your time. Thanks very much for having me, mate. So for those who haven't come across you and Arita Performance, give us a bit of a background. What was your kind of own journey as an athlete growing up? What kind of sports did you play and how did that evolve into to coaching? Uh, so I was always very interested in lots of sports, I suppose. To, I sort of never really excelled in any one thing, but played loads of different sports. So like rugby um, was the main one. Boxing was the main one through sort of uh, later teenage years. And uh, bef you know, before that and, and throughout, little bits of football, swimming, uh, things like that. So exposure to a load of different stuff. Um, later on, found wrestling, but I was always, already sort of on my journey when I found wrestling. And that's sort of been uh, sort of focus of a sport through my 20s. And, um, I was always very interested in training myself and I think I I was into SNC before I knew what SNC was in a sense that I was interested in training myself to be better at the sports I was playing and I and I trained for that purpose. So I'd I was very influenced by like Bruce Lee um and uh that's so I'd read all his books about training, follow his training programs and things like that. Uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's encyclopedia of bodybuilding, you know, all that, these little books and classics. <laughs> the classics. And then um, I would, and I'd write uh, training programs for myself. Eventually, I'd write training programs for my friends. Um, so it was always a big part of what I was interested in. And then I sort of, I, I went to, I tried to go to sixth form. I didn't really want to go to sixth form, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I dropped out basically middle of the year. Ended up working in the city um, in London as a quantity surveyor. So I remember feeling quite grown up at the time, but I was 17 and now working with like 17, 18 year olds, re realizing how young I was in a way. Um, and I realized within a couple of days of doing that, what a big mistake I'd made. I'd never wanted to work in an office. I'd, I'd basically gone there just because I didn't know what else to do. Um, and then I did that for a year. And then I dropped out of that, uh, sort of a bit lost, not knowing what to do, did every other job you can think of. Um, and I've, around uh, probably 18, 19, come across SNC as a concept, uh, as, a, as a discipline, uh, as a potential for a job. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I started then working back towards that, which meant I had to go to like a, a night school for a little bit, then a foundation degree and um and I got a college course so I did a few things to get back to university basically um and then once got to university oh, I actually went to Loughborough to do physics a foundation degree in physics which was forced because they wouldn't let me on a sports science degree without um uh, they said I could do sports science and physics but uh, I had to do a foundation degree in physics and obviously Loughborough was meant to be the place to be so uh, uh I did that but then for me it wasn't it wasn't right as a place it wasn't right as a uh, course you know it was just 300 people on the sports science course wasn't really given the idea of it wasn't what I wanted anyway so I ended up at St Mary's and sort of um, ended up on a strength and conditioning science degree and and then from there was a lot more focus really and a lot more understanding I suppose clarity and what I wanted to do um, and just progress progress from there through through my career really. Mm. And you've obviously, you know, reading through your bio and, and, and knowing what you do, you've obviously touched points in a lot of different arenas in terms of physical performance. So, you know, like, like you're saying, obviously, um, rugby with Wasps and Seven and um, Tokyo Toshiba, but equally football in terms of Fulham, you know, uh, water sports in terms of GB Canoe. So you've you had fingers in a few different pies doing different things at different times. Yeah, I've been really lucky to just experience so many different environments and some uh, for long periods of time, like in the sevens, I've been with for over five years. Uh, Wasp, I was there for over three years. Um, but then other places like Tokyo Toshiba, I was just doing some consulting on contact skills for, uh, I think, just over a week. But you, know, you get to immerse yourself in this environment and it's so it's so different. And then you learn from that. I feel um, we can get this into this a little bit in terms of the philosophy of coaching but for me the best athletes are those who best solve the problems presented to them in their sport and I think it's the same thing as coaches and then you've got this uh, the specific arena of coaching with the sport you're working with at any one time but there's a general skill of coaching so I feel to develop that a breadth of experience is really important and I've been lucky to fall into some opportunities that um, have provided that and I've and I've also consciously aimed for that as well I've been very aware that um I've got an interest in lots of different things as well. I'm very interested in sport as a whole, almost like mastery as a whole, not just um, not just one sport. Um, so I've always sort of seek to learn from as many different places as I could. And that's probably why I've, when the opportunities came along, I've always said yes to them and then 
um, at times making myself far too busy and far too stressed and I needed to but it was always great learning um, it was great learning opportunities mm, no, that's awesome I definitely I completely agree in terms of you know that idea of a breadth and and having that problem solving ability is something I speak to my players a lot about not just technically but tactically physically nutritionally like you know if you can't solve your own problems there comes a point where I can't help you on the pitch anymore and you, you need to have that wherewithal to be able to analyze what's happening in front of you and, and figure it out Absolutely. So what's what's your underlying driver for this? So you obviously kind of mentioned learning and a bit of a curiosity of different experiences. Have you ever thought about what's kind of that that real big big motivator for you? Yeah, I think about it a lot, and I don't think it's something that I'm a hundred percent clear on, and something I'm still exploring in a way. But it's definitely centers around this idea of um, like mastery um, potential, and and I feel like it's to do with just making the most of this time we have. The short time we have on this earth you know like we're here to make the most of it and i think um you know exceeding in competitive environments isn't the only way to make the most of it but it's an exciting journey within what can be a bigger life and uh so it's something i've always enjoyed competition myself never really maybe never focused on it early enough but also didn't have like the the technical tactical abilities young enough to make moves in that in a, in a sense and maybe probably not more than anything not the psychological discipline at a young age to be able to do it. I'm, I'm always so impressed with the the psychological maturity of so many of the young athletes I work with because I didn't have that until I was much older um, and maybe still haven't the um, yeah so it's, it's around this idea and, and a retail as a concept is about living up to your full potential so it's an idea i've connected with and i think it was something that i connected with from reading about bruce lee and his approach to things which is very centered around mastery and i mean bruce lee's been this point he's not like it's not something that i've like, i'm obsessed over in any way but i read a biography of his when i was about 13 or 14 and then i, I went back and read that biography a, a couple of years ago and i realized how much had almost grown just out of that influence in the sense of my interest in training probably was sparked by that but also my interest in philo uh, philosophy um he talks about a philosopher called krishnamurti who i read when i was 16 he's an he's an interesting uh philosopher to read when you're 16 because it's very much about you know don't listen to any authority in a sense <laughs> make your own mind up which is so important but as a sort of anti-authoritarian led 16 year old i probably didn't need to read that at the time but, <laughs> but what's great about that is it's been like a central idea so what that means is as everything else i've learned i've always brought it back to my own understanding of it i've never been you know i'll get into stuff and i'll i'll sort of binge on certain thinkers or certain writers and things like that at certain times but i'm always integrating it back in i'm not getting led into just following what they say for the because that's what they say it which i mean bruce lee again he, we've got this on the wall in our gym is uh, absorb what's useful uh, discard what's not add what's specific for your own so that just as a concept has been in the background of my mind i suppose since quite a young age and it's been probably quite influential Mm. It's funny, just as you were mentioning Bruce Lee, that was the quote that was ringing in my head. I was trying to remember exactly what it was, but you, you did it verbatim. So Bruce Lee's obviously been a big kind of influence. Are there any other experiences or people? I mean, you've obviously worked in a lot of environments. You've come across a lot of very good coaches and very good athletes. Are there any that stand out as being really influential in your coaching journey? Yeah, I've actually got a slide I've been putting on uh, presentations recently, which has got... Uh, one of the slides is my influences from sport, I suppose, more that have influenced me more technically, maybe as an SNC coach. And one is about my influences in a uh, broader life. So I'm probably able to list it quite in a quite detailed way at the moment. It's relatively fresh in my mind. Um, so I'll start with sport and then this because the other one's probably a little bit broader. So I'll go sport, I think, like I say, taking up people like Bruce Lee, who I'd almost include in, in the other sort of slide, really. Um, there was, I think, Simon Nameby, who was my first influence into what SNC was. So Simon Nameby was from the same area I'm from, grew up, went, like, sort of, was involved in the same rugby club. He used to come down and do sort of speed sessions. And then through that and through conversation and me saying, this is pretty cool, like, how can I get into this? Um, him sort of talking about SNC and giving me some websites to follow, like Elite FTS, uh, DeFranco's, Westside Barbell. And then me just going on those websites and almost like consuming everything I could. And um, Louis Simmons and Westside Barber had a, a reading list. So then I'd go and buy all those books and read all them. And I, I would, I'd read a lot of them before I even started uni. And I didn't understand them, to be honest, but I just read them, um, which is a common thing I do with books. You know, you don't need to understand it straight away. It will catch up with you eventually. Um, so 
in terms of those sort of thinkers, Buddy Morris, the same one, Elite FGS, James Smith, the thinker, like they used to write articles and it was always about uh, this holistic idea of sport. So I was very connected to this holistic idea of sport. And then all of the stuff that we recommend would be um, mostly Russian influenced, these like uh, Eastern influence and, um, and then Charlie Francis as well. So that was sort of my foundation coming into university. Um, and then in university, you get more of your broad, I suppose, exposure to research and, and, and things like that. I, I was never sort of taken with research as an approach. It's something that I think I'll probably come back to with more interest in later in life. I feel like I wanted to go out and coach and, 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 and that's why I was always interested. I was interested in coaching. So I wasn't taking too much of the uh, process of following research, but I would, especially while I was in university, read an awful lot of that as well for that foundation. So people like Martin Boucher, um, David Girard and like their conditioning um, papers and things like that, hugely influential on my conditioning um, philosophy. Um, uh, Stephen Saylor has done a lot of research on endurance athletes. Again, hugely influential in terms of how I think about conditioning. And then it's not just conditioning really, because all of that adds into my overall idea of how do you manage a program? How do you get the best out of athletes? Um, trying to think research, but it's just while we're on it, if there's any others that jump out, but you know you come across some key papers key review papers at certain times in your life they're quite influential there certainly was a few of them around um around the time i was studying then it was people like joel jameson on conditioning uh coming across his book when i was probably in my second year of uni and just making sense of all you know you, you spent your first year most of your second year just exposed to physiology and, and not in a very applied sense and you've got these terms you're not 100 percent what they uh sure what they mean or how they apply and then joel jameson's book just gave me this way of connecting it together and then since then, um, so when I left uh, uni, my first internship, uh, internship was at WASPs uh, with Dan House. So Dan, again, really lucky in terms of how you fall, because Dan had come from the IS um, and had quite a broad background in sports himself. So he saw the world in that quite broad manner. Um, so I picked up probably an awful lot from him in terms of managing a program, uh, you know, that approach of utilising sports science um, that would almost be quite synonymous with that um, data-led approach that would be more well understood, uh, more associated with like an EIS or these big organizations. Um, so I picked that up first through Dan and then, um, but he had quite a balanced approach with it because he was taking that and applying it in team sports setting and you have to be, it's much harder to be purist with an approach in a team full of 45 people. Um, I, was, I was chatting to Dan about it the other day and it's something actually reflecting on it. He was, I think he was 30, 31 when he took on that role. So was, I'm 32 now, um, but I remember him, he was, um, but he, he, that was his first, he'd worked in England rugby with women and then he came into, so that was his first, first job in senior men's rugby, essentially. And um, him having to figure that out as he went a little bit as well. So, but Dan had a huge, huge influence and, I, and then he moved on from there to sevens. It became quite apparent to me as how they were going to try and play it is that I was going to end up with a lot of his responsibility. But at the time I was a junior by title, junior SNC. So I said, look, I want that. I'm happy with that. But I want a senior title and I want more money. And they said, yeah, they didn't give me as much money as the other senior coaches. On, but they gave me more money. So it, um, and that worked out, you know, so Dan moving on gave me that opportunity to basically I was co-leading a program. And I was a year and a bit out of university and I was quite aware that that was faster than I expected to progress in terms of title. And I was conscious that I could have sort of rode that title for the rest of my career in a way and done pretty well. But I wasn't interested in just the title. I wanted to have some depth under, underneath it. And partly because of the, the politics of the team. So I was there for another year, um, employed with the first team. But then I left and um, took on um, a consultant role with the academy which kept my foot in the sort of, well, gave me some consistent income, which was helpful. Um, but then I also then started to explore like my own consulting, doing more of the contact skill stuff as well. Um, and then obviously then picked up again with Dan at England 7. So Dan's been a huge, a huge influence. Um, who else? Like, and then Tappers, who's my business partner, who's at Wasp with me as well. Like, you know, you pick up from people and their approach and, and, and so much in terms of Tappers' approach and how he was with players. And, and you just pick out things that I suppose that make sense to you in terms of what the, what you connect with, like there, how you connect with people's approach. And I think Tappers is someone whose approach I'm massively connected with, which is why when the opportunity came to sort of uh, go into business with him, it was a no brainer. He was like the perfect person I had in mind if I was going to run a business with anyone. So um, 
that's that would be the key the key people i can think of from a sports perspective um from like the other perspective again i've, I've been so interested in reading um and and learning from so many different areas there's a lot of psychologists in there uh, i read a fair amount carl you and carl rogers i'm very interested in the moment i think carl rogers should be required reading for coaches um it's just this humanistic approach essentially you know it's this ability to connect with people help them along their journey to become the their full self he would talk about that sort of idea uh jordan peterson i spent a long time before he was sort of famous i suppose i've just come across him on the internet and binge watched all his lectures on psychology human behavior robert sapolsky uh, he's got human behavioral biology uh, lectures on youtube um why zebras don't get ulcers his books very influential re reading them in university um who else? A lot of uh, comedians and very influenced by comedians in a way in their approach, like what a comedian does is stands on the boundaries of the world and uh, uh, understand, explains them in a way through comedy in a way. So that, that idea of, and mythologically, this is quite a Carl Jung influence, mythologically speaking, the Joker character is that's the role it plays, you know, sits on the boundaries and uh, makes fun of things these, these ridiculous boundaries we put in place and we, we think they're real and then they they show that they're not uh, so that and then there's key people like dave Chappelle, i think you know uh, tommy tin and a two that i just i watch them but they're quite philosophical in terms of how they talk about so i connect with that side of it as well and then writers and a lot of writers um herman hess of uh, probably my favorite book I've shared a couple of times online, Siddhartha, written by Herman Hess, very much influenced by him. Um, people like Jack Kerouac, um, uh, who else have I been reading lately? Uh, Henry Miller, um, is, uh, Robert Persig's books. You know, there's a lot, lot of books that I've written and they've had, they've had a key, a key, a, a, a very powerful influence in terms of how I suppose view the world. So it becomes part of how I approach everything I do, including coaching, including having a business and everything else. That's awesome. That's, I, I love that because if you said to someone who just came out of uni, you know, what books are you reading? It would be, you know, Essentials of Strength Conditioning or Super Training, all these kind of things. But the longer yeah. you're in the game, the more you realize that dealing with human beings is complex and psychology is actually, you know, before I can get you on the on the program, I think you should be on, I need your buy-in. And that's a whole nother realm. And all those yeah. things you've mentioned there around psychology and, and interpersonal relationships and, you know, understanding human beings is a whole area we don't really talk about in coaching, but that's actually what we're doing every single day. It doesn't <laughs> matter what you, know, if you can't communicate or get it across. Or, and actually, it's not really about what you know. It's about the other person's problem they're trying to solve. And then you using whatever you've got in your toolbox, whatever that is psychologically, technically, physically, you know, to help them on their journey. That's essentially what we're doing. Hmm. So how has your philosophy evolved over your career? So you've mentioned a lot of influences, a lot of maybe slightly different schools of thought. So give us a bit of a, I guess, a whistle stop tour. Of what's, what's your philosophy these days and how's that been changing? Um, so it's, I can quite clearly define it to a point, but the, the, I, I haven't really redefined this for myself in the last five or six years. So. At one point I sat down, I just defined in a, 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 through presentation uh, for myself more than anything else on what my philosophy was. And essentially it can be summarized in, uh, I came up with the term cultivate heroes, which was very influenced by Carl Jung, Jordan Peterson and like mythological ideas of the hero story. Um, but heroes are those who can face chaos and come up with a solution. And, you know, in the stories that might be come back with treasure um, or the, you know, the traditional uh, George and the dragon stories about um, fighting a dragon and saving a princess. Like it's with all these stories, it's not about the literal sense of them. It's something underneath that it represents. So I, I read a lot into that. And I thought at the time I came up with that, I was working simultaneously with uh, Speedworks and Jonas to do um, so, someone else I should have mentioned actually in terms of my sporting influence, just being a year, just spending a year in, with him and the, not just him, but the other coaches that were there it was such an amazing environment to be in. Um, and I love, I love that athletics environment and it was the, the pace of life. I could learn a lot. So, um, but, so Jonas, I was there with Speedworks. I was at the English Institute of Sport uh, with GB Kayakin and I was with uh, England Sevens and the RFU. And then I also had my own business, which was essentially um, me, mostly me personal training, bits of consulting in terms of contact skills and stuff like that around it. Um, that same year, uh, my wife just started studying medicine. She was pregnant with our second child. We had no money. 
like even though I was working a lot with nobody massive huge uh, debts and things like that. so we were in the we were in the midst of chaos but at the same time I was like binge listening to binge watching Jordan Peterson and and then reading lots of Carl Jung and then this is all that chaos and order isn't he <laughs> Yes, and all, yeah, so it gave me a narrative to make sense of what was happening to me in a way. And I could, um, you know, couldn't do much about it, but I could just understand in where I was relative to where I've been and where I was going. And, and that story was very powerful. So I essentially summarized my philosophy in terms of going, well, what is it that all of these sports, all these places I'm working with, what's the connecting idea? And it was this idea of heroes. I thought, well, my aim ultimately is to cultivate heroes and these individuals that can face the chaos or the unknown and uh and prevail that's what great athletes do and the greatest athletes we hold in the highest regard do that time and time and again in the most precious situations um and and that's why they're held up in our society as heroes essentially and that's why they get paid big sponsorship money because they reflect that um so that was the the summarizing idea so how do we develop heroes um well, heroes are those who prevail within chaos so they need some exposure to chaos but from my own practical and uh, experiential understanding too much chaos can destroy you um so you want to be able to balance that with some order and the yin yang and we use the yin yang a sort of a modified yin yang is one of the sort of symbols we put out a lot in the rite. um the Taoist, the Taoist would talk about the yin yang as a representation of order and chaos with the white representing order and the black representing chaos and they would talk about you needing to keep balance between both sides. You need one foot in order, one foot in chaos. Um, so that that was something that I could see is in terms of what we're doing as coaches. Well, we can provide chaos or we can provide order to an athlete, both physically, technically, tactically, uh, or psychologically. Um, and we have to understand what tools we have to, to do that. So when we start to look at more coaching process, and, you know, people jump to like the constraint said model or uh, more like direct uh, queuing, you know, direct queuing is almost like providing order. It's giving them a guide out of the chaos. Constraints led model is dropping chaos within on them. OK, and then we can, you know, so at a broader level, rather than thinking, right, I need to do constraints based or I need to do this. I think, well, where's the athlete? So how do you know if they're in chaos or in order? Well, are they comfortable or uncomfortable? Okay. And we just need, and we need them to be in slightly more chaos than their order, otherwise they won't develop. But we also need to know and be able to recognize that when we've pushed it too far, and obviously too much physical chaos will end up in injury, too much psychological chaos will end up in some sort of breakdown. Um, it's too much psychological order is boredom. Too much uh, physical order is means you're not stimulating enough to get a response. And then the same within technical and tactical, you can go either side of it. So it gave me this broad framework for then being able to walk into an environment and going, okay, I understand the principles here. I might not like, so for kayaking, for example, I didn't have a clue about kayaking as a sport when I got there. I had a month to figure it out, but I knew I could have a framework for understanding it that really helped me. So that's essentially broadly been my philosophy in some form or other. Like the, I might use different terms and it's developed in some ways. But that's been an idea is to try to understand that big picture before I then start even worrying about putting in the details of exercises. Like exercises are the very, very last thing I even think about. And I'm willing to change them all the time for any reason. If an athlete comes up and says um, something's changed uh, in their schedule or something's not feeling quite right, then depending on what's coming up, you might just adjust the exercise and then address the problem in a different way. You know? So there's exercises are the last thing I'm interested in. That's awesome. I love what you said there because... I think you just gave a really good overview of of that philosophy of chaos and order. And it's something I've been contemplating recently, just thinking about the game of rugby. You know, defensively, your job's to create order when the attack's trying to create chaos in your system. You know, isn't it? It's trying to adjust to that and, and recreate order to prevent that attack. Whereas an attack, I'm trying to break down the order of an opposition's defense and create chaos in it to exploit them. Um, but the, what you've done there around the, the physical side of things, I think, yeah, it makes perfect sense. Just that whole thing of direct direct uh, queuing and constraints makes perfect sense yeah it has to come back to those principles like i talk about that a lot with my speed and agility stuff attack is you're trying to create separation from a defender uh, and defense is you're trying to create um you're trying to stay connected with the attacker so they don't have space you're trying to create space for yourself or you're trying to take space away and i think we i saw a post actually this morning talking about uh, first principles thinking i've not heard of that term before but it's apparently something that um like Taleb and I've read a lot of Nassim Taleb's another one I've read all of his books and probably quite influenced by his idea of anti-fragility before I came to the order and chaos stuff I was onto anti-fragility and that was my sort of term for it I suppose um 
first principles thinking from what I picked up in the article I read this morning is about that just a bit like I'm talking about going beyond all right we do this exercise or this method or that method it's like well what are we ultimately trying to achieve why is that important and 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 that's probably the way I've approached my understanding of sport in a way since I've basically been interested in it mm. no it's, it is funny because like as you say you kind of we're obviously standing on the shoulders of the people who've been before and you know the, the we think maybe there's slightly more rationale or slightly more reasoning to the way people have ordered you know organized sets and reps or whatever but for example you know someone organizing three sets of 10 or 10 sets of three might have a completely different reason for doing it but if we just accept it at face value actually there might be five or six different ways we could organize that to get different outcomes but if we just said right three sets of 10 is the prescription that's what we're doing as you say well hang on this we we could you know change the exercise we could change whatever we're doing but if you come back to that first principle of well, what are we trying to achieve here what's the actual outcome then that might lead me away from three sets of 10 i might do clusters of threes or i might do you know something do it completely different but if we just take things at face value then we, we end up being kind of pretty robotic and pretty similar to everyone else don't we yeah and i was in a um this is exactly you have to understand the underlying physiology and, and anatomy and, and and then almost um and then the response you're expecting to get from the intervention you make and then there's no thing where we just go here's the intervention and step back it's a prod and it's a way to see how it responds and i think that's consistent across great practitioners in any field that's not just s and c great physios or great osteopaths are the same thing they'll change something in the system and then they'll see how the system responds and what we're dealing with is such complex systems in terms of human beings operating in a more complex system of a competition you know we have to be able to um, the idea that we could do something and absolutely know it's going to work is ridiculous. The idea mm. that you have to squat, you have to this, you have to that is just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, it has to be a, look, well, this is a, a, based on my experience, based on what I understand about physiology, anatomy, whatever, maybe even psychology, this is what I think with my expertise at this moment. So I'm going to suggest this to you and we're going to do this in the program but I'm completely open to then that coming back and going, ah, oh, that didn't work, did it? Like, <laughs> you know, and then, and you have to have that humility in, in how you approach it because otherwise, um, uh, otherwise you're, you're running around doing stuff without any idea on what your effect really is. So like we, we exist as our little S and C role exists in a much bigger system of that athlete or that team's uh, life. And if we don't understand, the rest of their life in a way or at least how what we do generally connects with all those different areas we're much more likely to make things worse than we are to make things better as human beings we're more likely to make things worse than we are to make things better because we approach everything through this very narrow um, viewpoint which is our intellect we think our intellect's the whole world and it's not it's just a small part of it and um, that's where we where we can go wrong so i'm always trying to check myself on that in terms of am i getting carried away with these ideas mm. No, I think that's true. When you watch great coaches, you know, they, they have the humility to kind of go, mm, that didn't work, let's try something different. And there is that interplay. It's not, this is the prescription and you will respond like this. It is, I'm going to change this one thing and see, that, can you organize your system better? You know, does, does me making you, you know, hold a stick overhead, does that organize the lower body better? Or what if we change this one thing? And it's like, they're kind of like constantly running these little experiments and not all of them work. And they go, ah, actually, Chuck, leave that, it didn't work. Yeah. And then because and then the conversely, it's about taking responsibility for that, because that can be used as a get out of jail card. Like, oh, I don't know. You know and it's in can end up almost being nihilistic when actually it's taking responsibility for the idea that you don't absolutely know, but you're willing to put something forward and, and taking responsibility for that. If it goes right, if it goes wrong, where your part is in that. So it's this simultaneous, almost accepting we can't control the world. But accepting that we still have power to affect it in some way or other, and um, and that power can not it's not necessary that it's positive or neutral. There's a lot of stuff spoken about in SNC as if it's only positive or neutral, not that actually if I do this it can also be negative. And every single decision you make, every single thing you do, can have either a positive, neutral, or negative effect. Everything for me is this risk and reward uh, trade-off we're trying to make all the time. Mm. it's funny as you're speaking there I was, I was thinking it's really kind of reminiscent of the Dunning-Kruger effect like I'm always very aware of coaches who have all the answers you know, I'm just I'd want to steer clear yeah, of everyone because if you've got all the answers that tells me you actually don't know what you're talking about that was a statement I came up with years ago and it was probably just bastardized from a few different places I heard it was beware of those who offer answers um, anyone who's coming along telling they either got the answer and this is it you know they probably they almost certainly don't or they don't 
have the answer and there's no the answer and actually they're much more likely to hurt you and harm you in some way or other um than help you mm -hmm. so tell us about i guess your own little bit of chaos how did the rete performance what was the birth of that and the kind of catalyst of that and and what was your i guess your desire to start something for yourself i don't know it was quite organic in a way i think i've always been interested in business again like i read books about business while i was in university like general business i was interested in it i'm very interested in lots of things so it's, it's not much i've done has been massively right i'm going to do this now it's been like okay this is quite interesting let's play around with this and then it's grown i mean the arete in terms of the concept as a, a thing has been that's 12 years 10 years in the making that's an idea it's a concept it's a the logo the curve the stimulus adaptation which it was originally um inspired by was something I drew in a notebook in probably second year of uni. As I came across the word Arete in a book in the second year of uni and it, um, and connected with it. Funny enough, when I went back and read that Bruce Lee book a couple of years ago, it mentions the word Arete, but I'd never, it didn't jump out at me then. It didn't mean anything to me then. But then when I went back and read it, I was like, how crazy is that? There's this little seed got planted at 13, 14. And then when I re, um, it's like that idea that the master will reveal himself when the student is ready mm. uh, um, or the teacher will reveal himself when the student is ready. Like that's that idea. I wasn't I wasn't in the place to be able to make any of that at 13 or 14. But at 22, 23, um, I was especially having gone through almost like probably quite a traumatic experience of the idea of facing the realities of life quite abruptly. I didn't I think um, it was hard at the time but dropping out of school and then dropping straight into an adult world in an office with all the shit and everything that uh, bothers them that um someone's creeping up there <laughs> wow thank you very much this is a tea tea delivery <laughs> um the with all like that so going from being in school, I was in all I was interested in was playing and messing around. I had no interest in going to university. I had no interest in revising or anything. I just was running around getting trouble, basically. I wanted to go into sixth form and do the same thing. I then wasn't able to. And when I realized I was going to have to do exams and the other stuff, I basically dropped out. But from that, I had to go, drop straight into a full time job in the city, surrounded by people who hated their lives, who hated what they were doing. Like that, now I understand, was quite a traumatic, scary thing. Um, and but it forced me to have to face the realities of life if you don't take some responsibility for what you can do and, and what you want to do and all the rest of it. So that was a that was a really useful experience for me. Uh, I've forgotten what the first question was because I've been put off by tea being delivered. <laughs> oh, we were just kind of expanding in terms of you know how a retail performance came about. Oh, and retail, yeah. So <laughs> so sort of that. So. I'd always been doing all this uh, sort of reading around business and things like that. I was interested in business. Even when I was at uni, I wasn't thinking I just want to go and work for teams. I was also thinking about my own ideas and what I could do mm. with that. Um, when I first got to Wasp as an intern, two weeks, maybe a bit longer into being there, they had a meeting with the whole team, sat everyone down and said, uh, no one's getting paid this month. And uh, as an intern, I was getting £200 a month, which is quite good for an intern. Um, and uh, I was like, but all my living came from personal training. It all came from outside of that. Um, and so I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, like it's, but I also was like, this isn't a sport. You, this isn't a thing you can rely on, you know. Hmm. Uh, there's, I think Stephen Jones was in the squad, you know, incredibly decorated, one of the best Welsh players, the best players ever, 100 of the caps for Wales. And he's getting told the same thing I'm getting told as an intern. I'm like, wow, you, you know, you can't rely on this. So I think that probably made me realise I would have to, again, be responsible for my own destiny in one way or another and not just rely on these teams to look out for me. Uh, but like I say, even it's more from need. Like I had to, I had um, I was personal training within... Uh, I think I started personal training seriously within a couple of months of starting at Wasps and um, that was where all my income came from. And then when I got a paid role at Wasps, I was like, well, I'm still doing the same amount of work. I might as well carry on doing the same amount of personal training. You know? it was, so for a long time, only until April of this year, I've basically been out the house at super early, sort of five o'clock and then back in the house at 10 o'clock almost every day. So it's been a consistent, long, hard, and even to have the Arite has meant that. And the same with Sevens. Um, when I got the sevens role, I was 
still doing a retake. So I'd finish work with sevens, intense, full on job. And then in the evenings, it would all be working on the retake and the days I wasn't working. So, and that's sort of paid off now because when they pull it from underneath you, you know, I, I needed to build stuff up to build my income up because I would, never took loads from a retail, but I still had to build up more income, but I had at least a half a framework there in terms of a business and a brand and the stuff that I could do that with it. So mm. um, it's been quite organic, to be honest. But And it, to be honest, it never really took off until um, Tappers got involved and there was two of us. We could bounce ideas of each other, uh, support each other. And um, it's, it's so much more than just, like we always say, if there wasn't two of us, it would be much, um, it wouldn't be like half a, a retail you know, what it is. It would be a quarter or an eight for something like that because just the way you bounce with each other, the way you balance each other out in terms of skill sets, it's um, it's very, very powerful, I think. Mm. So a bit of anti-fragility there and having having something in the background that you're ready to plug and play when the, the mat get pulled out. It's interesting you pick that up because when I was reading anti-fragility in that first year, I was at Wasps. So I was very conscious about structuring my life in an anti-fragile manner. I actually used to talk to Kate, uh, my wife, about that to say that, well, I've got Wasps. Uh, which at that by that point the second year was paying me I had the personal training stuff that I was doing for myself I was also getting um, I also worked for a personal training company um, so I had this sort of split of income that was get, I knew that if one of them fell away I could pick up one of the others within reason so um, mm. I always tried to keep that in mind it's harder as you progress and, it, and it's you have to work double basically in order to mm. create that situation and um, I suppose no one in SNC uh, is uh, shirks work in any way. Like it's it's not really possible to not work hard and be involved in SNC. So very true, very true. So tell us a bit about what does the retail look like day to day? Like what are the is the scope of people you're working with? Is it you know general public? Is it just the sevens boys? Is it right down to to youth? Have you guys got your own facility? What does that look like? Yeah, it's pretty broad. So um, there's four key areas we sort of break it down into uh, that we work with is be uh, maybe more than, but essentially elite athletes, uh, which encompasses teams such as Richmond, um, rugby and and when in one-to-one works we work with a variety of one to, uh, athletes one-to-one in different times in different ways sometimes face-to-face sometimes mobile support uh, like programming um, and then youth athletes which would encompass basically camps and schools um, and academy we've got an academy based out of Richmond with 25 kids now it's going really well um, and then one-to-one sort of work as well You've got um, with the general public is something we're sort of moving more into with our everyday athlete program. Um, but and that's so we've got two gyms now. We've got one based in Richmond, one based in High Wycombe. And uh, and then the other part of what we do is coach development. So that's sort of the performance lyceums, but also our own sort of um, stuff. We've done speed and agility seminars. I did a conditioning webinar in the summer. Um, so that's all part of that as well. And then all the coaches that work with us, coach development is a massive part for us in terms of their experience so we like we want them to feel like it's an incredibly valuable experience being with a retail so hopefully you know we're able to have enough work that they stay with us and grow but even if other opportunities come up and they end up in different teams that's fine and that's great too because you know uh, once we get a reputation for developing coaches and it's the great place for that we're always going to get a good um we're always going to get good young coaches coming to us to want to develop and uh, that balance between having the right people interested but also us making we work hard and making sure we work hard to develop them which again is a lot of work you know it's not it's not work you're getting paid for directly in a way it's something that you're going right this is what the we think the company to operate needs great people and we want to help great people become even more great that's sort of what that's the underlying principle with everything we do so that's what that's what connects the elite to the youth to the everyday athletes and the, the coaches we work with it's all about helping someone progress on their personal journey in one way or another um so that's i suppose the connecting point yeah coming back to that cultivating heroes i guess doesn't it yeah exactly yeah I mean, you've had some, like, you're obviously saying there about, you know, wanting people wanting to feel like it's valuable to work for a retail and valuable to be involved. I don't think it takes much digging to to see that. And, like, the calibre of guests you've had at the Lyceum is, is like, outrageously high. Um, so for people who haven't come across the, the performance Lyceums that you've had before, give us a bit of a, I guess, who are some of the headliners that you've had over the last few months or years? Yeah, we've been pretty lucky. So we had... Um... 
so we started off with Dan Howes and Clive Brewer, which um, obviously Dan was a close connection. Um, and then Clive was someone we'd interacted in with before. And um, but again, as a starting pair, it was it was pretty cool. Uh, and then from that, actually, um, my favourite one, uh, the second one we had, uh, which I, was my favourite one in a way, because it was two individuals you won't find much about online at all. But they um, one of them was Carlo Buzzichelli who's um, rewritten some of Bomper's books on periodization. Amazing coach who I spent, um, uh, I think, 10 days out in Cuba with, and I trained with the Cuban athletics team, who he consulted for at the time, and uh, still does, actually. And then with him was the head jumps coach of Cuba, um, Alexander Navaz. And you think, like, you're, you're not getting an insight into the Cuban jumps program, as we were able to. It's incredible. And it was in Spanish. So Alexander presented um, his presentation in Spanish and then Carlo um, fully fully getting invaded Carlo translated okay. yes okay you can have one later see let's see this look say hi we're recording a podcast you take them, you know, take them, take them downstairs with mummy. Mummy will let you have them. Here you go. Yeah, I remember seeing uh, seeing those two names and thinking, that's not two names I've come across before, but that completely explains why. Yeah. And there's a whole journey with this. Like, you, you realise, and we've, we never started the Lyceums for for profit, really. It wasn't about making money. It was just something that we were interested in and excited, and it's been amazing for us, and it's sort of way over-delivered in terms of our expectations, in terms of our what we've been able to learn and, and things like that. But um, I remember being really frustrated at the time. I was like, why don't people get part of it? Look, we, we could have been better at marketing it, definitely. But, you know, part of it is there's that fickleness of people will come to see who they've heard of. And that's completely mm -hmm. understandable in a way. And it's a lot of effort, especially in SNC's lives, to go out of their way to, to listen to stuff. So I've come to understand it, but I remember feeling at the time, like, why isn't everyone here? Like, this is amazing. And I think we only had, like, eight people there um and it was but it was brilliant so you know it's, it's, i wasn't too bothered because i got to listen to it in a way and that was an amazing learning experience mm. for me. uh the third one then is where i think people started to realize we were there is because we had damn path so um from there i think that's where obviously uh loads of people came to that one and then all of a sudden people knew what we were doing and, and what we were doing it um i can't remember the exact orders now from there but we've had people like buddy morris from the nfl um uh what else we had brian mann uh kier's done once he's an old friend here we all worked at wasp together but his one was one of my favorites as well i've always loved his ability to just concisely um i suppose put across ideas and he, he did this um presentation over his learnings basically almost like um little aphorisms on um his, his journey so far and it was it was brilliant um Blimey, who else we have? Frank Dick uh, recently. We've had James Haskell. Um, I know I'm forgetting some really big ones here. We had what a great one with Remy, Ben Rosenblatt, and Dan again on rehab. Uh, we had Gordon Bosworth, physio, one of the best physios in the country. They're just um, and again for us, it was trying to find people just who are absolutely amazing in their area and and put an event on that was experiential, story based. It was never. There's a lot of events on that are presenting research. There's nothing wrong with that. But we just recognise that all of them are about that. And as coaches, we were interested in the coach's experience. And something ourselves, um, we've gained so much from conversation, from coffee shop conversations. And even mm. actually when we've been to conferences, those conversations you have in between presentations almost being as valuable as the, what you've been presented. So we tried to create, that was the whole point of the Lyceums, was to create a space where that happened. And even to the point where we played around with things like um uh like how the chairs were set out so we used to set the chairs out at the start as you would do for an event and everyone sat down and didn't speak to each other and waited for the event to start like wait for a talk to start we were like ah we don't want that to happen so we took the chairs away and we put little stands where people could then they'd congregate around and they it worked you know they ended up chatting to people they wouldn't chat to so it was almost about it was about that experiential learning from other people's stories. The best way we can learn is from our own experience. The second best way I think is from other people's stories of their experience. So what was great about providing that time for conversation in between is if there's a young coach there, and we always made to try to make them as cheap as we possibly could so that young coaches would come. Um, and again, I don't think we did as well as we could in terms of getting those student at coaches in which I really wanted 
them to have that framework and have that reference point of these great coaches when they're still learning because again I think they probably didn't know who the they didn't know the coaches were and they didn't value them so we ended up with quite an experienced crowd most of the time but you still get some maybe less experienced coaches who maybe wouldn't have felt comfortable asking a question at the end but they'd certainly say to their mate who was there who was maybe coaching at a similar level to them and say oh do you know what what when he said about that I've had that same experience and this is what happened for me and this is what I took away from it that's super valuable learning um, because if we're all going off just the theory and the stuff like that, that's what we wanted to hear was where does the theory not apply and when does it absolutely apply and can we figure out that line and, and providing that space where people can have that conversation was the whole point. Um, I'm talking a bit about it. It's like it's, it's finished. It's not coming back. <laughs> it feels like at the moment because we had, we had a few planned for this year and obviously we didn't do it. I thought about doing it online and look, to be completely frank, you can make much more money doing it online than you can doing it in person because more people will sign up, it's cheaper to run um, and all the rest of it. So, but that's not what it was ever about. And I don't want to corrupt it by just chasing money from it. If I can figure out a way to do it online where it can be, a real, like you can still get those connection options, then I'll probably maybe look to do that. But the whole point of it is about the connection, about the stories and about that sharing. So if I can't figure out a way to do it online like that, then I won't bother because it was never about a profit thing for us. It was always about just something that excited us. And to be honest, we've got enough going on. To, it, it takes a fair amount of time to yeah. put on. So I don't want to I don't want to do anything that's a chore. But, and that's sort of how I'm, with everything I do. I never want to do anything that's a chore. Like why? Why would I bother? You know, yeah. uh, some things have to be a chore, but generally as much as I can, you know. That's what I'm always thinking. So, so tell us a bit about your the kind of youth programs that you're running at Arite. What how does it how does it work? Do you, you know cover off the the kind of physical elements, the mental elements, nutrition? What does that look like for you guys? Or do you have any kind of operating procedures that you use in terms of addressing those different areas? Um, not not massively like process driven because everywhere's different. Like you know, schools are different. The individuals you work with are different. Uh, there's um, obviously it all comes back to that same idea is we're trying to help the individuals be better at solving problems and they are helping the school solve some of their problems by helping their individuals be better at solving problems. And it all fits into that. So it's very much has to be quite, um, I'm trying to think of a better word than bespoke because it sounds really wanky, but like, it's not, you know, like it's, um, it's like, how do you like connect with where they, what they need? So with the school programs, every school is so different. Like there's a certain framework and way where we're, we're sort of, we generally work, but we want to give the coaches that are there, you know, freedom to be their great coaches. We're selecting them for being great coaches. So we're not there to tell them exactly how to program. We're there to support them with the program and build it towards something that can be Become somewhat of a consistent framework for that school but that will always evolve but that what schools tend to get is coaches in and out and then there's nothing left behind so that's where I feel we can be really valuable and um, we've got a long experience now of working in schools um, and between um, in Tappers and everyone else in the company there's like maybe a hundred years of experience that can be um, sort of shared amongst each other. So the coaches working in schools get to share their experience within each school with each other. They get to help each other out with resources. Um, and we get, and one of the things we do with the coaches, our coach, we have like an internal coach development club, which is different things. Again, similar to the Lyceum, bringing speakers in. And we've had some amazing speakers on that. We've had Dan Howes on, do one for us recently. Julia Heddy is an amazing physio. Um, you know, we're doing them as well because like we said, the coach's development is the most important thing to us, really, because we know that's that's how we can uh, create a great company by having great people and helping those great people progress in their own way as well. So that takes me, your uh, mention there about resources takes me quite nicely onto the next question. So are there any particular resources? You obviously mentioned, you know, Krishnamurti and Siddhartha and those kind of, uh, kind of classics. Is there anything that you would, you know, your real top of the bunch that you would point people towards if they're coaching young athletes? Is there anything that stands out to you as being important? For young athletes? Probably if I was, this would be one of my recommendations to most coaches now, uh, would probably be Carl Rogers on Becoming a Person um, as a book to read. Like you've, especially, I think so many athletes and so many young kids are experienced like this authoritarian approach. 
And then again, we've got to find this balance. We want to give them some structure, but we also want them to become confident enough in their own abilities that they're willing to express that and not willing to give up in, in anything they do. So I think understanding what human beings need is much more important than anything else I could recommend right now. Like any methodological approach to training young athletes, like there's lots of methodology that I would suggest is important versus other methodology, but ultimately there's too much, I think, of coaches at every level of sport projecting their ideas in a, in a forceful manner that we have to share our experience. We want to guide people based on our own experience, but there's not enough um, of just trying to understand their experience. I think we need to be a lot better at understanding the young athletes experience and what they're going through and what they want and what they, and then how do we guide that? So I feel like something like Carl Rogers on becoming a person as a book, as in, as a way of this uh, more humanistic approach is, um, would be more valuable than I think anything else I could recommend. And that's something awesome. I think in terms of a retail, that's as a business, as a company, um, it's, it's about that really. That's something like me and uh, Tap has just come up with a word he calls buddiness, which is again, wanky, but it's sort of, <laughs> I guess the, the idea is, it's like, why would you do it in terms of you're trying to just make profit at profits for the sake of profit? Like it becomes a cage. You create a cage for yourself. You create the very thing you were trying to get away from. So I'm really conscious about that as having a business is the responsibility that you don't want to create this thing. That was the thing you were trying to get away from the whole time. Mm. So, and that takes some, you know, deeper thought in terms of how you make each step of the way, because of course you need profit. Of course you need to grow the business in order to make it something that can be the special thing it is for all the other people who work within it and all the people you work with. But if that's all you're doing it for, you're going to, you're the one who will end up suffering as much as everyone else will for your approach. So it's a hard thing. It's a hard a way to approach things, I suppose, but it's, it feels good at the moment and hopefully it can carry on growing and keep that sense of this feels right. This feels positive, I suppose. Fantastic. That's a really good, really good summary. I think there of, of what we've been saying in terms of coaching that's applicable to every sport, every performer, every age group, you know, I think we need more of that rather than arguing about, you know, which, you know, it's five by five better than this or whatever, you know, we need more, more discussion people. around the person in front of you. Yeah, I don't understand where people find the time like to, I mean, if we're going to argue, there's plenty we could argue about in the world that are much more important than that, but then even that, I'm not sure if the arguing helps. Uh, <laughs> yeah, very true. So where can people find out more about you and about Arite? Um, so I suppose uh, Instagram would be um, where we're most gives a, a good blend of what we, what we do. Um, Instagram, I think, is uh, at Arite, under, so A-R-E-T-E underscore perform. Uh, I think it's the same for Twitter. So across those two things, sort of the work we're doing, we'd put out, we're not great. It's something that actually, um, if, if anyone listening who's uh, big on media or like uh, social media and interested in helping us out as a, maybe like a, an intern thing to start, but potentially growing, I'll use this opportunity to say that we're looking for someone who can do that. Cause it's something we've been trying to create. Me and Tappers aren't that way inclined really. And um, I know it's something we can do a lot better. You, you know, we're doing a lot of work all the time. Very rarely we find the time to be like, look, here's what we're doing. I don't think it needs to be much more than that. Um, so uh, also the uh, website is arite-performance.com. That's gives a good overview of, of what we do, who we work with and, and uh, sort of experience. Um, my Instagram, I think is Tom underscore arite perform. Um, sometimes there's stuff about training on there. Sometimes I post books and random quotes, uh, but I suppose you'll get a sense of what I'm doing through there as well. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time today, mate. I really enjoyed that conversation and chaos and order and, and in coaching. I think it's really applicable. So thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. No, no problem at all. Thanks for having me.